Hello, I'm Matthew Weinstock, Managing Editor of Modern Healthcare. Thank you for tuning in to the latest edition of The Checkup. Last October, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association announced that Kim Keck would be taking over as president and CEO for the retiring Scott Sorota, who led the association for 20 years. Kim was very well positioned to take on this new role too, having served as CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Rhode Island, and before that, spending 28 years with insurer Aetna. I'm pleased to be joined today by Kim to talk about her new role, some of the trends she's seeing across the industry, and where we might find ourselves post-pandemic. Kim, thank you so much for being with us today. It's great to be with you. So let's start. Uh, you started January 4th. We just recently celebrated President Biden's 100 days. You're a little bit past your 100 days in office. Give me a sense of what those first few months have been like for you. What's that transition been from, excuse me, from a uh, small state Blue Cross plan to managing, you know, 36 different Blue Cross plans across the country? Yeah, sure. Well, in many respects, like you said, Matt, it was a nice uh, starting point to come from one blue plan. And I had the privilege of, of running a state and understanding how Blue Cross Blue Shield plans operate. And I, I had one state, but I really truly believe that we're markedly different in our connectivity to a community. I often said in Rhode Island that community service was in our DNA. And I do believe that is the case uh, for all blue plans. And as you suggest, I came into this office uh, January 4th. And of course, just as the COVID-19 vaccination process was beginning uh, for the country. So one of the things that we did early on as blue plans is uh, initiate something called vaccine community connectors, where there's that word again, community to help ensure that vaccines were equitably distributed, particularly to socially vulnerable seniors. We partnered with AHIP on this work and had a goal probably starting in February of this year to get 2 million, sh 2 million shots in the arms of socially vulnerable seniors. And now we're moving, of course, beyond that. So coming into the new role in the middle of the pandemic got to uh, stress that community connection and uh, of course it's what we do every day it, obviously so much and we could talk more about what you've been doing on the pandemic front and the shots in the arms for for those communities so much of you know your first four or five, five four and a half excuse me months have been pandemic related how have you been able to shift gears and focus on any of the, the other organizational priorities you've had for the association and what might a few of those be? Well, it's interesting because last mm -hmm. year, in fact, last summer, Blue Cross Blue Shield plans across the country took a pledge to make meaningful change on health disparities. This was following the George Floyd uh, murder in 2020, in the spring of 2020. And then in the fall of 2020, we approved at the board of directors, a national health equity strategy. So uh, part of what I came in to do is in fact, uh, make that national health equity strategy a reality. And the two are, are obviously connected with the vaccine community connector, but more broadly, the national health equity strategy was also launched a couple of weeks ago, I think now, uh, which was a priority, is a priority for 2021, but beyond 2021, because we know, of course, that COVID-19 exacerbated longstanding health disparities and, and really, honestly, to deadly proportions. And you know the statistics. We know that Black Americans are dying from COVID-19 at a rate one and a half times greater than white Americans. We know Native Americans are dying at twice the rate of white Americans from COVID-19. Uh, we also know we have a black maternal crisis in this country where black women are dying from pregnancy related complications at a rate three times that of white women, white American women. So the national health equity strategy also to focus on maternal health was underway in 2020, but that was also a priority as I started in 2021. So certainly launched that and are feeling confident about uh, the traction we are gaining there. Yeah, we just did a story a few a week or so ago about the new maternity plan that's targeting um, the inequities there. What do you 
how are you going to measure success out of a program like that? How do you know that you start to make a dent? Because obviously the data will take time to catch up to yeah. what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely, Matt. And in some respects, that's partly why we have five years, right? The goal is to reduce maternal um, health disparities by 50% over five years. And right, it, in, in some respects, we have got to shine a spotlight on this now because this crisis is longstanding, but we've also given ourselves some time, start here right, right now. Uh, to your issue on measurement, right, this isn't a one dimensional issue, so it certainly won't have a one dimensional solution. One of the measures though we're looking at is what's called SMM, uh, Severe Maternal Morbidity Index. I hope I got that right from the CDC. Uh, I sometimes, I think that's right. Uh, but it measures among other things, complication rates, unexpected outcomes and delivery. And we will certainly be using others, but uh, working with national experts to measure the success. But also, as I said, it's also things like even one of our blue plans in Michigan is uh, implementing unconscious bias training for 20,000 providers in the state. And so we'll be looking at how we get that one program as just one example and saying, okay, did it change disparities in any way, shape or form? And how do we amplify that to the 1.7 million providers that we contract with in the country to really make a measurable impact? Yeah, I'm curious, lastly, on the on this front, um, building off of, you know, as you mentioned, the George Floyd murder, everything we've seen with COVID and the disproportional impact that's had on communities of color. We talked to a lot of providers and how they think, you know, coming out of this, it'll change their approach to population health and reaching patients um, in those communities, addressing, addressing social determinants, obviously. I'm curious from that payer perspective, if you think about that program in Michigan and some of the other things you referenced, what's the payer responsibility and, and where do you think the payers are going to pivot to start to address uh, structural racism and, and some of those issues? You know, we already are. I mean, certainly the national health equity strategy is absolutely aligned to do that. But I think there's plenty of examples on which we can build in the blue system as payers, right? And I don't think we are just payers. Back to my sort of opening statement about blues plans are so community oriented. I think the combination of our role as a payer and our role as a community leader really come together on creating an equitable system of health and one that serves all populations. So I, I can think of a couple of examples. One would be a, an example in uh, Care First where we have had maternal health program underway for some period of time, actually almost a decade, and we've seen infant mortality decrease by 30% in that community. That was not just sort of how we pay. This is how we integrate into the community. This is about having community health workers literally go door to door into the homes of vulnerable moms, work, working with them on things like nutrition, prenatal care, going into the home, do you have a safe place to live, coming back repeatedly up to the second birthday of the child, for one example. Um, but there are many others. In Rhode Island, the plan that I just came from, we had launched a couple of years ago something called the Rhode Island Life Index which took the combination of the things that you're asking about, Matt, sort of the payer relationship, but importantly, the connectivity to the community in terms of the needs of what gets in the way of someone's health and well-being. And if someone doesn't live in a safe community or have um, access to transportation or secure affordable housing, they can't really have a health outcome. And so the Rhode Island Life Index partnered with policy makers, community leaders, not-for-profit organizations to really understand the data, but to drive a convening and drive different outcomes to say, we want to collectively make a difference, not just again, how we pay for healthcare, but how we think about achieving overall health and well-being. Got it. And so we're going to pivot a little bit to how you pay for healthcare, but this does, this question will also get into that totality of healthcare as well the idea of uh, the relationship between payers and providers post pandemic, you know, we've heard a lot about the need to move to value based reimbursement or capitation, global payments, all those things, which we've been talking about for feels like generations. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk, we still haven't seen a ton of movement there. There's it's been incremental. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, sort of give me a snapshot of where you think we are? Yeah. And then where do you think uh, we need to move and how do we move there even as we're 
trying to you know manage our way through the the pandemic yeah so i would amplify one of the things that you just said matt there has been a lot of talk and um it, look it's a welcome conversation I, I think we need to move beyond the talk and as you suggest we've been having these conversations for some period of time but certainly the conversations are picking up and it's a welcome uh it's a welcome event i i do know you know many know that the pandemic did have of course some needed and um, innovative approaches to how care was delivered and certainly virtual care, maybe even not virtual care, maybe a little too strong, but maybe even telehealth, of course, some digital disease management and site of care changes that were really needed. But one of the things we know, and I think this is something we absolutely have to sort of leverage, if you will, or build upon is the fact that providers who relied on value-based payment arrangements during the pandemic fared better than those who did not, right? When the pandemic first came and we all were asked to stay home, we know there were no services. And in a fee-for-service model, when there are no services, there are no fees. But it turns out, not surprisingly, that providers who relied on value were uh, better suited, not just from a financial stability and resiliency perspective, but even in, from the perspective of coordinating care. As we think about Blue Cross Blue Shield membership, we have about 67 million members tied to some form of value. So that's a great, you know, it's a great number. We serve 110 million, so two thirds of our population tied to value is a great start. About 50% of our costs are tied to some level of uh, value, if you will. But I actually do think there's more to do. You mentioned capitation, global budgets. I think. We, we can't just have, uh, in my opinion, incremental change. I think we actually have to try meaningful change. I'm a big believer in primary care, even potential budgeted or capitated models. Certainly in Rhode Island, we had great success there in working with uh, primary care and thinking about how to spend more potentially in primary care, even give a fixed budget, even if it, it might have been 10% of overall costs, for example, spent on primary care versus an average state of maybe six, 7%, but to do so in a way that actually got at the high cost issues that sometimes are preventive, preventive or preventable. Uh, one other thing I'd say, Matt, on that is we know there are great examples to build from. North Carolina is one uh, that we I often cite because Blue Premier uh, started by Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina a couple of years or so ago. I can't recall. It might have been last year. It's a, it's a little bit of a blur. I guess it was a couple of years ago. And its first year had about 150 million of savings uh, and uh, better quality. So it, these models can work and um, we'll continue to push them through uh, the next phase as we work our way through this pandemic. So is it just a, a matter of getting more of those stories out there so that providers and, and insurers as they're entering into contract negotiations can build off of those? Or is there more, do you need more of a national push as opposed to sort of one-offs? You know, I think it's a combination and I think at its core, there has to be what I'd call sort of a uh, agreed upon components of what really works, right? So not just, uh, thinking about it one off, but really having transformation. I, like I said, I happen to believe in primary care, but really thinking about the critical components of what makes these models successful. So it could be integration, coordination, team-based approach, something that touches not just physical health, but obviously mental health, particularly given the crisis that uh, the uh, pandemic has created. Uh, the linkages between home and virtual, I think now will be a new component of value-based arrangements, certainly uh, enabling access to data, technology, um, and wrapped around prevention, right? So I think it's really focusing on the components of what really works and advancing a model of um, based on those components. You, you touched on telehealth a couple times. Obviously, there's concerns about where we're going to be in terms of reimbursement for that. If we're going to fall back to sort of pre-pandemic mm -hmm. um, reimbursement structures, there's obviously some conversation in, in, in Congress around telehealth. Um, from a Blue Cross Blue Shield Association perspective, you know, where are you thinking that we'll we'll go in terms of making telehealth reimburse in a way that makes sense 
for for both sides you know that that, that we find that um equilibrium for everybody yeah good question matt and one that's on many many people's minds i think in some respects though it may be too soon to say because telehealth was a great alternative uh, during the pandemic and clearly has a role in the health delivery ecosystem going forward i don't think that's going away but i think we do need to understand its role in the delivery system and how it will work before we really understand the reimbursement if you think about this is obvious, but we're saying, I think, uh, as we move past the pandemic, there's certain limitations to telehealth that I think are not trivial, right? I hear from a lot of providers who say that in-person interaction is really, in many respects, the best way to diagnose and tr truly fully evaluate a condition uh, with the patient. I also, of course, we know that prevention and in, even things like immunization, of course, can't be done in telehealth. In 2020, I think our data in um, Blue Cross Blue Shield across our all of our plans saw a 20, 25% drop in immunizations uh, for obvious reasons if people weren't seeking in-person care. Uh, but that's a concerning trend that I don't know that we you know, want that to continue. So I think the short answer on telehealth reimbursement is it's just too soon to say where that should fit. Yeah, it, it, we're hearing a little bit of that in the congressional debate that's been going on too, is sort of, and even at MedPAC, I believe, you know, sort of yeah. give us some time to see where the, how the data falls into play before we set lock some things into place. Um, Kim, it's been great talking to you. Uh, you know, we could go on for a bunch of subjects for a while, but we try to keep these pretty short because we know you guys are very busy. Um, we'd love to check back in with you in, in a little bit and see how things are going. Maybe your second hundred days or something to that effect. Um, but again, thank you so much. Uh, we'll be sure to follow up with some of these things down the road and stay safe. All right, you too. Thank you, Matthew. And I'm Matthew Weinstock with Modern Healthcare. Be sure to come back next Monday for another edition of The Checkup.